Lynn, the next question comes from someone who is a, a rather well-known um, uh, Roosevelt uh, historian and who is something of an economist in his own right. I guess you'd call him really an economic historian. But what he says is he says, Mr. LaRouche, I know you've addressed this before, but it continues to come up as uh, an issue in our discussions. And I wish that you would settle it uh, for people once and for all. Of course, what I am referring to is the question of John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard Keynes. He says, uh, it, I continue to be astounded by the number of patriotic Americans who still refer to themselves as Keynesians. He said, and this occurs despite the fact uh, that as Robert Skildesky stressed throughout the final volume of his biography of Keynes, Keynes spent much of his energies during the war fighting for Britain, not against the Axis, but against the ascending economic power of the United States. It is also the, the case that Harry White was well aware of this. As a matter of fact, one of the things that was found among White's personal papers at Princeton was a yellowing piece of paper salvaged from the first Anglo-American discussions that said, quote, in Washington, Lord Halifax once whispered to Lord Keynes, quote, it's true they have the money bags, but we have all the brains. Although White's personal papers did not name the author, uh, it's widely thought that Dennis Robertson was the most likely candidate. But the fact of the matter is that the entire British approach to the talks that resulted in the formation of the new Bretton Woods were directed toward preserving and continuing the imperial system. As a matter of fact, he envisioned the clearing union primarily as an agreement between the two founder states, i.e. the United States and Britain, with the United States included only because we were, quote unquote, the money bags. I'd really like you to address this specifically because any idea that key American patriots are Keynesian is absurd. And it is in fact the case that although White was forced to make certain compromises with Keynes, uh, that he did in fact see Keynes as an adversary. Would you please comment? Well, there's a lot of literature on this which comes from the Roosevelt circles as such. And Roosevelt was a determinant of US policy, not Dexter White. Uh, Roosevelt understood what the British were. Uh, I mean, it, there's no question of this. If people just mystify themselves but are not doing the relevant research, which is readily available on this thing. Remember that Roosevelt was a descender, a descendant of the Roosevelt who had worked with Alexander Hamilton in the establishment of the Bank of New York, which was the enemy of the British-controlled Bank of Manhattan. We have a bunch of traders, that bank, and they were literally traders. Aaron Burr's bank was the Bank of Manhattan. And Aaron Burr was an agent of uh, the British Foreign Office since his founding, as well as being an assassin and a punk and everything else as well. So Roosevelt's understanding from, and, he, and he documented this in a Harvard paper he wrote on this subject when he was graduating from Harvard, that he always understood this clearly. He understood the American system. And he understood it better, especially after he had polio, where in his recovery from uh, polio, he did extensive studies and reaffirmed and deepened his understanding of history, and he already had a family understanding of what his family background was. 
He also knew what his cousin was, whose father, whose uncle was a real traitor. So when in the case of the 1944 Bretton Road proceedings, Roosevelt, for various reasons, was not there physically. But his messages were delivered there. And Roosevelt's purpose was, as it was made clear, as he told Winston Churchill, Winston, when this war is over, there isn't going to be a British Empire. I'm going to free these people. We're going to give them their freedom. Hmm? There are not going to be any more colonies. We in the United States have had this long, too long. You, with your ways. And that man, pointing to a uncle of the present, prince, uh, the present uh, consort of the queen. I was in India, you know, at the end of my military service in the post-war period. And I was involved in Calcutta and being in Calcutta, as I've told people a number of times, I, having time on my hands and being in Calcutta, I went to these, uh, all these offices. I took, I took the telephone book of the Calcutta telephone book, looked up all the political parties. And I made appointments to meet all the political parties in their offices in Calcutta. It's on my own private interest to do so. I just had the time there, they were there, let's find out what's going on here. So I met, became knowledgeable very quickly with all these political parties. And I was beginning to operate because I had a consensus of what we as Americans wanted to do with India. And particularly I had one experience on the Maidan of a couple of people who were coolie status at that time were eight income honors a day pay for doing digging and so forth for the British Raj. And they, two of these two guys came up with a student. And the student said, will you talk to these guys? And they, they spoke this Calcutta Hindi. They didn't speak English, and I didn't speak theirs. So we had a conversation, nonetheless, by the courtesy of this Indian student. And they said, they want to know is when you go back to the United States, are you going to send us a machinery so we can develop our own waving industries and not be slaves like this. That's what I was getting. It's typical of the kind of expression I was getting from, well, Bengalis are noted for this kind of thing, but from, from my Bengali friends with strong, this was the area where uh, Chandra uh, Bose, uh, Gupta Bose uh, was involved and so forth. Uh, and so this was this kind of mood. So I was there, and on a day I was not in Calcutta, there was a, some friends of mine, nonetheless, were had a, a demonstration at the Governor General's Palace. It was a routine demonstration. It happened all the time, usually without consequence. But there was then a Lathi charge ordered by the British, by the guards, on these people. Now, these Lathis are bamboo stick with a metal tip to the thing. And they have quite nasty weapons in dealing with crowd control. And so the number of people were killed in simply a, an ordinary demonstration. So two days later, there was on Durham Tala, which is the street leading across Chowringi to the Maidan, the big area there. And uh, a large crowd, I wasn't there that day, came down protesting against this atrocity by the British guards, or the hired guards, against the killing these people, these students. And so the machine, the, the, in, the British police, who controlled the area, took two heavy machine guns, and they stuck them in the middle of the street at the intersection of Dharamtal and Chowringi. And as the crowd approached, they opened up with full fire and kept running. I, the following day, when I was there on the scene, the residue of blood on the street was un unbelievable. Now, the result was that the Indian population uh, crawled over train on tops of trains in every other way to go into Calcutta in response to this atrocity. And I saw a situation which I was standing there in the middle of in the midst of the time and seeing this vast crowd of millions of people 
marching day and night for more than three days. And they were mixed, they would say, one, the crowd would admit, one section of the crowd would admit, Jai Hint, up with India. And then the echo would be in the same crowd, Pakistan Jidaba. And you would hear this resonating. And this was going on for these days. And the power of independence was in the hands of India at that moment. And what happened is Lord Mount, uh, Mountbatten went to the Indian leaders and said, we will promise you status, independent status next year. Stop it now. Rolls that had died. The next year, what did they get? The next year, the British organized religious riots vast religious riots, which resulted in the partition of India into India and Pakistan. This is the kind of, this is the kind of thing you're dealing with in, in dealing with the, with the British Empire and so forth. This is what we're against. And if we don't have the, uh, don't, don't have the sense of this, we get to this problem. Then Keynes is part of this. Keynes was an evil bastard. Look, in, 19, in the 1980s, he wrote the first edition of his general theory. Now, this is in the, 19, the 1930s. The first edition of his general theory had a, a German translation, had a preface written by Keynes, saying that the reason he had published his general theory in Hitler's Germany was he thought Germany at that time had economic policy tendencies more favorable to his book than the English language uh, audience to adapt. Keynes was a fascist. Now, Roosevelt knew this and understood it, and Roosevelt campaigned in the Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire, campaigned to eliminate Keynes as a factor. So Keynes essentially was out of it. And White and company were actually following the instructions and opinion of President Franklin Roosevelt, who had made clear what his post-war intentions were. But unfortunately, convenient for the enemy, Roosevelt had died in the meantime. So that spring, in April 12th, when Roosevelt died, things changed. On April 13th, Truman was president, and the British were running the joint under, under Winston Churchill. And the first sign of the clear sign of this was Keynes was reestablished immediately. It was not a, what Roosevelt had proposed is distinctly was a fixed exchange rate credit system, not a monetary system. Right? So what we got again was a fixed exchange rate monetary system, which then became Keynesian. And everybody who is an economist who likes to get fed as an economist will generally kiss butt and praise Keynes because, Keynes because that's still fashionable. But Keynes was a fascist. He's a very evil fellow. Sharp, but evil. And to this day, that's a problem. Now, the reason it's a problem is also because of the ignorance in our universities. We have a certain, in our university system, a certain toleration for garbage. It's an academic disease. And therefore, if your colleagues in a university feel very strongly about something, and if the people who fund the universities are inclined to the Wall Street persuasion, then anyone who knows that Keynes is a bum is going to hesitate to say so. They may say so in a very roundabout way, you know, the usual kind of academic gibberish, but they're not going to say it straight up. And the problem is, is, I find people in Europe the same thing, the Keynesian system. They all believe in this Keynesian system, which is nothing but imperialism. It means that it always has meant, and it's meant in European maritime culture ever since the Peloponnesian War, that you have a power, and this was true with the Persian Empire the same way. An empire is based on what's called the oligarchical principle which is what it was called by the Greeks. And that means that a financial oligarchy or a financially powerful oligarchy runs society. They run society by controlling the valuation of what is called money. 
Governments do not control money. Not governments in the sense of republics. Self-governments by people do not, are not allowed to control money. Money is controlled by an agency which is imperial. The meaning of empire is that, is the control of a monetary system which is tyranny over trade. Now what happened that was peculiar about, the, about European culture is that with the defeat of the Persian Empire, at least its defeat to attempt to take over the Mediterranean, meant that the Greeks were in a position to define a maritime culture as a hegemonic culture together with Egypt. But what happened essentially was that the Delhi started the Peloponnesian War, so the Greeks get into a war with each other over who's going to control the value of money between the mercantile cities of Athens, uh, of, of Corinth, and of Syracuse. And they destroy themselves. Then gradually you get an empire laid by an agreement between the cult of a, uh, this cult of Mithra and the candidate for the emperor of Rome. And you get a Roman system, which is an empire. What is the empire? The empire is the control over a system of money. That's what it really was. And the empire will take different peoples, which are called different national groups, um, and they will pit them against each other in wars, local wars and killing. For example, the, the Romans killed off a German population, as was known as the German population in that period. They conducted wars with all, among peoples as a way of controlling society. What happened in the Seven Years' War, which the British got themselves an empire, what happened in the Napoleonic Wars, is wars on the continent of Europe, among nations on the continent of Europe, were means by which an empire was controlled. Not by just military force, but by use of warfare and similar kinds of conflict among people, and they would weaken themselves by fighting each other, and the empire would rule them. And the money system works the same way. Who controls the value of trade? Look what's happened to us now. No nation on this planet no large nation on this planet has food sovereignty. What has happened through globalization is that every nation on this planet, if you, ha if you have food, you sell it to your neighbor. If you want to eat food, you buy your neighbor's product. And the middleman, the monetarist in the meantime, like Monsanto, controls the trade. We no longer do we have food security of any nation on this planet. We are the victims now of an international financial cartel which controls the supply of food for every nation. You produce food, you produce it for another country, sold through a middleman. You will find the, a, a, the policies are to reduce every element of food self-sufficiency of every nation on this planet. And that is the Keynesian system. And the fact that you get a fair trade, so-called, from an arbiter who says who lives and dies. Well, we have an arbiter. We have a fair system. We have an arbiter who makes sure that we don't cheat on each other. But the arbiter cheats on both, like Monsanto on food supply. And that's what the Keynesian system wants. So it's an imperial system. Our, we understood this when our republic was founded. Our constitution prescribes we have a credit system. No credit can be issued except by the federal government, by an act of Congress, the federal government, except emergency grants which can pass by some resolution by the Congress. We do not allow an international money system to control us. What we do is by treaty agreements among nations, we let's say each nation has its own credit system, but we make agreements among nations, of, among credit systems, for a fixed exchange rate credit system. We make agreements, treaty agreements, by the sovereign power of, of the federal government, or by the presidency. We make sovereign agreements with other sovereigns on trade agreements, on credit agreements. But the, the power over the society never passes to any agency above the rank of government, of sovereign government. And what we have is we have, un, we have an unsovereign system, which Keynes represents, 
an unsovereign system of swindles by which we're deprived of our sovereignty. We say we're free and independent people. We aren't. You don't even control the food you eat. Your own country doesn't control whether you live or die of starvation because of what has happened in the recent period. That's what the problem is.